To build monuments, monuments representing royal power and religious glory, cities have often sacrificed the immediate well-being and comfort of their citizens. They were glad to give to their kings and their gods what they denied to themselves. As long as the meaning of these great monuments remained alive, the sacrifice was partly repaid by visions of splendor and hopes of eternity, which lifted men's hearts and released their energies for the daily task. But there was a dark side to this blessing. Except for a small minority, the life of the common man too often went on in cramped, dark, insanitary quarters. Poverty caused overcrowding, filth accumulated, disease spread. Houses that would have been tolerable in an open country village became slums in a crowded city. When the towns of Western civilization began to grow in the 16th century, slums grew with them as workshops, factories, and crowded tenements expanded the old core of the city shrank and the old vision of a better common life faded and every part of the city suffered. In the 19th century, a human flood of the displaced and disinherited from town and countryside, drawn by the uncontrolled forces of the Industrial Revolution, poured into the old cities, multiplying their riches, their size, and their power. But poets, like William Blake, saw the squalid truth that lay beneath the surface of golden London and her silver Thames, thronged with shining spires and corded ships. That truth was more obvious in the new industrial cities that sprang up in the once green countryside. They did not deserve the name city. The city was jammed onto pieces of land left over between the dump heaps, the railroads, and the dark satanic mills. They bound him in an iron chain. They burned him in a holy fire where many had been burned before. The weeping parents wept in vain. Are such things done on Albion's shore? They were. And never before in history had so many people lived in such ugly and savagely debased surroundings. Their working hours were long, and their lives were short. I wander through each dirty street, near where the dirty Thames doth flow, and mark in every face I meet marks of weakness, marks of woe. In every cry of every man, in every there infant's souls cry... souls of, of men are bought every... and sold, and milk-fed infancy for gold and youth to slaughterhouses led, and beauty for a bit of bread. Is this a holy thing to see in a rich and fruitful land, babes reduced to misery and fed with a cold usurious hand? Is that trembling cry a song? Can it be a song of joy? And so many people poor, it is a land of poverty. Every night and every morn, some to misery are born. Every morn and every night, some are born to sweet delight. Some are born to sweet delight, some are born to endless night. Those whose greed or indifference helped create the slums fled from the city, turning their backs on it. The ears of the inhabitants were withered and deafened and cold, and their eyes could not discern their brethren of other cities. O oh, Rose, thou art sick. The invisible worm has found out thy bed of crimson joy. Pity would be no more if we did not make somebody poor, and mercy no more could be if all were as happy as we. Though the city was the source of much of their riches, the wealthy in their country homes renounced most of the responsibility of making the city fit to live in. Of course, through other hands, the wealthy still controlled the city. And, of course, they gave a measure of charity through other hands.
Slums still blemish and degrade our cities. Many of them are leftovers of the 19th century, as are the private and public interests that permit them to remain. More than a hundred years of agitation and legislation have not wiped out the slums. Indeed, in most cities, they are increasing. Many of this century's slums may seem less foul and debased than those of the Industrial Revolution, but they have inherited the same legacy of physical congestion, the same spirit of social hopelessness. Twentieth century reformers tried to eradicate the slums, but somehow the other side of the tracks usually remained the other side of the tracks. The new public housing projects that replaced some of the slums were cleaner, roomier, tidier, more open, but something was missing which sometimes was found even in the worst of slums. There was a lack of identity, of continuity, of a sense of neighborhood, and of close-knit family life. This sterility is inevitable when our public housing projects are economic ghettos, segregated from the city's daily life or when to justify the high costs of clearing out the still profitable slums, we heap families up into giant complexes of huge barracks without thought of the human costs of this barren and institutional desolation. Life is often more vigorous and spontaneous in semi-slums, which have so far escaped renewal. This is no justification for leaving things as they are. It simply emphasizes the steady deterioration of urban living areas. For the poor have had their sad revenge. The overcrowding that began in the slums and the sterility of most public housing projects is spreading to the homes of the middle and upper classes throughout the city. Often now it has become difficult to distinguish a public housing project from a luxury apartment. Constantly rising land values are crowding out the old homes and transforming pleasant neighborhoods into rows of expensive filing cabinets for human beings. Only high density housing will make high profits in these areas so that in many ways the standards of the slums have become the standards for most city dwellers.
conditions of living in slums, public housing projects, and luxury apartments are, of course, worlds apart. The more you pay, generally, the larger your rooms, the more numerous your bathrooms, the more extra space for guests or servants. Money will give you year-round air conditioning and a doorman or two to guard you from unwelcome guests or more dangerous intruders. But there are many human needs that cannot be satisfied by money or mechanization alone. In building communities, we need fresh air and direct sunlight everywhere, safety from traffic, insulation from noise, pleasant tree-lined walks and sheltered open spaces for relaxation, accessible schools, churches, markets, playgrounds, parks. These needs can be satisfied only by public effort and imaginative architectural design. Stock mechanical plans based on large-scale repetitive units and standardized construction overlook and repress these human needs and turn their mechanical extravagance into human poverty. Yes, all through history, when congestion, disorder, or disease made city life intolerable, people found a simple, too simple remedy. They fled from the city and let it get worse. But until rapid transit became available, the distant countryside was beyond the pocketbook and the traveling time of the ordinary citizen. Relief from the city's evils was open only to the wealthy, the Roman in his villa, the Florentine on his estate in the hills, the Londoner in his country house. But in the 19th century, the privilege of escaping to the country became possible also for the middle class. The flight from the city of the well-to-do middle class at the turn of the century created the first suburban communities with their park-like settings for the family home. For those who could afford it, Life in this one-class romantic suburb was idyllic. In particular, it met the needs of child-rearing in a green, if unreal, retreat. The homes aped the country estates of the wealthy, and so did the life, which slipped into a bland ritual of competitive spending. Here, leisure and domesticity could flourish forgetful of the distant urban industries that made them possible. In pushing away the city, the romantic suburb also pushed away the city's vigor and vitality. Life in the suburbs was not a drama full of challenges and tensions and dilemmas, but a play world. The play finally became an end in itself, but at least the suburb established play space as an essential part of the city, not to be crowded out by high land values. That was a permanent contribution. The romantic suburb was designed to preserve an unreal image. It was not merely child-centered. It was based on a childish view of the world, in which reality was sacrificed to pleasant illusion. The romantic suburb lasted only a few generations. This synthetic utopia paid the price of its popularity when the automobile made possible the mass suburb, an even less convincing illusion of man's old desire for the good country life.
toute la journée. Bon, mais ça prend de la surveillance. C'est bien beau payer ce diplôme pour que ça fasse. Mais ça prend de la surveillance. Oh, ça prend quelqu'un pour surveiller non, ça. Non, non, non. Garder les enfants. Bon. The suburb needed its smallness and its rural background to achieve its own kind of semi-rural perfection. As soon as the motor car became common, the pedestrian scale of the suburb disappeared. Then so did most of its individuality and charm. Beginning as an avenue of escape, the suburb turned into the very opposite all that is left of the original desire for initiative and individuality is the driving of the car. But this itself has become compulsory and inescapable for the suburban commuter. The suburb is too scattered and thinly populated to be served by efficient public transportation. Older children may still walk to school, but as distances increase, the school bus and the chauffeur parent eliminate the leisurely companionship of going to school. The suburban adult spends much of his time moving between suburb and city, often of necessity renouncing the responsibilities of citizenship in both places. Once adult males and older children have departed, the suburban routine may be disturbed only by the delivery man, often the only break in the monotony of the day to come. Genuine human need created the suburb, the desire for a safe and healthy environment for raising children. By building communities for only one stage of life, we have produced an isolation from reality more complete than in the smallest village or drabest industrial town. Suburbanite has the advantages of neither solitude nor society. No shopping center can give cohesion or social focus to the sprawling suburb. The suburban family has the benefit of a regular expedition to the impersonal supermarket, where only by chance are they likely to meet a neighbor, and where shopping has become routine, mechanical, and compulsive. <laughs> 
Suburbia offers poor facilities for meeting, for conversation, for common action. It favors silent conformity. Humanly speaking, a universal suburb is almost as much of a nightmare as a universal metropolis, and without the variety and challenges of the metropolis. In many respects, the level of urban living has been rising. If we think mainly of more motor cars, more radio and television sets, even more schools, universities, libraries, orchestras, above all, more creature comforts for private enjoyment. But as our cities expand in mass, this culture is becoming homogenized and standardized. Not the growth of urban populations as such, but aimless and socially undirected growth is what is ruining alike the congested city and the spreading suburb. To renew the life of our congested cities, we must give them again some of the spaciousness and natural advantage of our best suburbs. To keep our present suburbs from blotting out the countryside, we must give them the social concentration and variety that only cities achieve. The task of the planner and architect is to achieve social complexity without congestion and to preserve the natural regional advantages without segregation and isolation. Under the threat of metropolitan power, expansion, and standardization, people seem almost instinctively to know that their communal survival depends on holding fast to the vital village element, always present in old cities. Stability, continuity, neighborly helping and sharing and a sense of being someone, somewhere. Even in the least promising places in our great urban agglomerations, the village spirit may persist. A street fair or a Saint's Day festival in an old city neighborhood is a recurring reminder of man's age-old insistence on his communal and personal identity. as this communal spirit persists, there is hope that man's communities will reflect the complex patterns and potentials 
of his own life.